let's talk about symptoms now. There's a new study out that says half of those infected will show symptoms in about five days, and almost everyone will show symptoms by 12 days. Now, the CDC believes the vast majority of people who contract the virus will only have mild symptoms. Carl Goldman was one of those people. He got the virus while he was on the Diamond Princess cruise ship, and here's how he described his experience. I got up uh, after waking up with a high fever. Doctor confirmed that yes, I had a fever over 103. He put me in a quarantine area on the plane where there were already nine other, past eight other passengers. I was one of nine. What's weird about these symptoms, and seems to be true for almost everybody, is I went days without knowing I had the virus. Then all of a sudden, just clicking my fingers, I jumped from normal temperature to 103. I just I developed a small dry cough, but unlike colds or other other flus that I've had, there was no stuffiness in the nose, no nose drip, no sneezing, no body aches, no chills. So it, that, that was the weird part of this. My worst symptom was the fever, and that hit for only about eight hours. And then like, like every fever after that, I was drained, feeling lethargic. I was definitely dehydrated. There are no antibiotics for this, so they were pumping me up with a ton of Gatorade. I've been through every color of the rainbow of Gatorade to uh, keep myself hydrated. And, and other than having the dry cough that still persists, it's getting better now. My containment area was about a 20 by 30 foot room. My wife never got the virus. She was put in a lower level biocontainment area where I am now. I don't know how she didn't get it and how I ended up getting it. I'm still stuck here while having to undergo three separate tests 24 hours in a row of being negative in order to uh, be released. And he's a gentleman in great he's a gentleman in great spirits. But that patient, and others have said that the flu is actually worse than COVID nineteen. Doctor Azar, is that what most people are experiencing? How's, how's that possible? You would think, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So, so we're getting to the number that uh, you know eighty percent of people are going to have a mild to moderate illness, um, and I think he probably represents that. Uh, um, all all of the clinical information that we're getting is done, you know case series here, a case series there, and sort of putting, painting a picture of what this disease looks like. Um, and I found one of the more recent case series to be particularly um, illuminating and that they described the flu we all know as that sort of stormy onset one day to the next. You feel really, really sick, achy, and high fever. And that coronavirus seems to be a little bit more indolent. So that means that, what does that mean? It means that you're starting with sort of vaguer symptoms in the beginning, that dry cough, fatigue, malaise, um, you know, achiness, and then sort of it starts to progress. And I think that that probably maybe reflects that that COVID, that coronavirus is sort of seeding the upper respiratory tract. And then the folks who get really mm -hmm. sick, it starts to make its way down into the lung. And that's when the shortness of breath and respiratory distress really happens later, as you pointed out. So really keep an eye on, on folks who are more susceptible to getting sick. And that's one of the reasons that people with the flu just feel like they basically can't get out of bed. They like feel like all truck. of a sudden it came on very quick. Exactly. But this one, not necessarily it as may much. Not. It may not. Exactly. And we know the elderly with underlying conditions are especially at risk. But Dr. Patel, I know your own patients are a good example of the different levels of risk. What profiles someone at a higher risk? What makes someone higher risk, especially in your practice? So anybody who's got heart issues, lung issues, diabetes, or they're immunocompromised. And one of the big questions I get at children in particular, especially children with asthma, I've gotten that question many, many times. Are they necessarily a higher risk with this? You know, um, anybody who has asthma, look, is a higher risk for flu. Um, so I think any uh, child that has this, the parents should just be told, you just take your necessary precautions, hand wash, don't touch your face. And uh, if your child is sick, please call your pediatrician. The other big question I get a lot of times is, do I send my kids to school? Do I send my kids to daycare? What are you telling parents? So if your child has a fever, no, please do not. <laughs> do not send them. And, you know, sometimes what the parents do is they give Tylenol or Motrin. Oh, look, you don't have a fever anymore. Please do not do this. We are talking 24 hours without any sort of Tylenol or Motrin, without a fever. Then you are allowed to go back to school. So and how about other children that are healthy? At the, should we be sending them to school if the school has said, 
Hey, we're going to close down. A lot of parents are getting upset about that. Well, if the school closes down, you have to follow your school right. policies. And look, the schools are very good. They're putting policies in place where they're working on instruction from home through the computers. And so I think everybody is going to be okay with this. And if your school says we're closing down to clean, that's fine. Let them clean. And it's for a purpose. It is for a purpose. And a very good purpose. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Azar, people are also watching their events, rallies, conferences. All these things are getting canceled. Canceled. They're wondering what they should cancel. If they should cancel their own parties, if they should cancel the events they have with large groups. What do you think people should be doing with their own things they're doing, not necessarily the ones that are out there in the public? Yeah, you know what? I, I think in this case, you really have to assess your own individual risk. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to sit there and say. What it, how old am I? You're asking yourself these questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's my age? What are my other um, underlying medical problems? Um, what's the degree of viral activity in the community? Are, are we seeing community spread here or are we, or are we not seeing any cases? Um, I think people also need to keep in mind that this is not going to last forever. And that if the public health officials are saying that at this point to mitigate the impact of this epidemic and now pandemic, requires social distancing, that everyone just take a step back and say, you know what, let's do this differently for the next three to six months, however long it takes. Um, I mean, essentially the proverbial nipping it in the bud, because if we don't do that, that's really the only weapon we have right now, right? We have no antivirals that are prophylactic anyway, um, and we have no vaccine. So all we can do is avoid transmission. And what I've heard a good rule of thumb is how much do you trust the people who are coming to your event to not come if they're sick? Well, that's the thing. And so if they if, do come if, with you right. sick, then obviously it's not mm -hmm. something you want to have happen. And, and we don't know yet, John, but like, I should be saying Dr. Torres. No, Dr. No. Torres, we really <laughs> don't know yet, you know, how efficient that asymptomatic transmission is. You know, it appears to be less efficient than flu, right. but we know that it can happen. So, exactly. yeah, we would love it if we could trust people that if you have a fever or cough, you stay home. But we know that, that A, that might not happen, and that B, people can, you know, can transmit when they're not really symptomatic. Exactly. And let's talk about one of the more confusing aspects of this outbreak, which is when to go to the hospital or when to get tested. Well, here's what the head of emergency preparedness at Boston's Mass General said on that specific issue. This is one case where we have to all come together as a society. Um, if everyone comes to the medical system for evaluation, even with mild symptoms, it overwhelms the medical system. We unfortunately did see this in China. We're going to have to communicate from the healthcare system, with public health, with everyone who takes part in this response. We're going to have to communicate very carefully. People need to know when to go see the doctor, when to go to the emergency department. They also need to know when it's safe for them to stay home. And that, that's hard when anxiety is as high as it is right now, but it's an extremely important message. And Dr. Azar, when is it appropriate for people to go to the hospital and get tested? Okay. If you are having trouble breathing, chest pain, intractable, intractable vomiting, diarrhea, high fever, you are going to seek medical attention. Ideally, you'll give your doc a call ahead of time so that they can let the emergency room know ahead of time so that they can prepare to have you in isolation. This is where hospitals around the country and medical offices across the country are deploying their virtual care. I spent easily half of my day today telling patients, giving them the information for our virtual urgent care so that you can be triaged remotely if you have mild symptoms. You can stay at home. You can self-isolate. You can manage this if you're otherwise healthy with fluids and fever reducers. But again, those four things, chest pain, shortness of breath, um, fever, and not keeping you know down liquids, you do need to seek medical attention. Don't be worried about that. And let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. What do you do if someone in the house has the virus and they need to be isolated? What does that mean, home isolation? Right. So it's very different than, than home quarantining, which, is, which I think is an important thing for viewers to understand. Quarantine is when you're not sick, but you've been exposed and you're just gonna isolate, you're gonna isolate yourself for about 14 days. Isolation is when you're actually sick. Um, the recommendation, and this is CDC guidance, is that if there is a sick individual in the home with coronavirus, they, there should be a designated area in the house that is just for them a bedroom, a suite, whatever the situation is, only one person in the household should be that person's caretaker who's going in and out and obviously practicing incredibly good hand hygiene the whole time. Importantly, at this point, if someone in your house is in quarantine, meaning let's say your spouse or somebody has been exposed but not having any symptoms, you don't need to be in quarantine also. At the moment, we don't think that the contact of a contact um, needs to also be in quarantine. If there's a lot of activity in, in the community, 
definitely reach out to the Department of Health if they feel differently, because there's, you know, we know that it can spread in clusters in families. Right, exactly. But for the most part, again, somebody in quarantine, you don't also need to be in quarantine, and the isolated or the sick person needs to be in their own designated area. And this is good for adults because they'll follow the rules essentially and do what they want to do, what we tell them to do or ask them to do. But Dr. Patel, for children, to <laughs> isolate children, to quarantine children in a home, that has to be difficult. How do you do that? So, you know, thankfully, we actually haven't had um, in the majority of the country to do this. And yes, there are isolated areas and regions that we have. I mean, at that point, there's no choices. Um, you. 14 days is 14 days. Um, but I don't think um, that any of the children have actually been seriously ill with the no. coronavirus, which is not good, very thankful. But how do you keep them in the house? How do you keep them in the room? <laughs> Come up with games. <laughs> Anything you can, Anything to, entertain, you can entertain do them. to entertain them. That's what you're going to have to do. <laughs> and what, another big question we get, which I think we should answer, is spring is coming. Warm weather is coming. And a lot of people are saying, you know, that could help contain this virus. Well, here's what Dr. Anthony Fauci told members of Congress just about this subject. So even though the concept that when warm weather comes, many respiratory viruses diminish, we have no guarantee at all that this is gonna happen with this virus. We simply don't know what will happen with this virus and that's creating a sense of fear. So Dr. Patel, what's your message to people about that? You know, it's the same thing that we've been talking about this entire time. Just be super cautious, um, wash your hands, don't touch your face, and live your life. Uh, and, you know, let's look for the experts to the guidance. Um, Dr. Fauci, let's see what happens, um, because as this is evolving, we're doing more research, and we're, we'll eventually come up with answers. Dr. Azar? Yeah, I, I've, what I've sort of tried to, to communicate to people is that you have to find a place between apathy and never leaving your house. You know, neither extreme is really what anybody is recommending. Um, I think people need to stay informed. Um, they need to react, but not overreact. Um, and just, you know, as Dr. Patel said, live your life daily and, and just, you know, keep your eyes and ears open for, for any change in guidance. And I think this is going to take the whole nation coming together to get this under yeah. control and hopefully under control sooner rather than later. But Dr. Patel and Dr. Azar, thank you both for your insight. Now, one of the other questions people keep asking is, what can I do to boost my immune system? Well, we asked Dr. Oz to look into it, and here's what he came up with. We're a can-do people. We like taking charge of life. America has always been able to mobilize because we had a clear action plan. So while everyone's waiting for the government and healthcare providers to fix the healthcare response to the coronavirus, here's some things that I would do if I were you to help your immune system. This is true for all problems, including the coronavirus. So keep that in mind. First off, breaking a sweat every day does help. It revs your immune system up so you're ready to go to battle if you were to get infected with the coronavirus. Sleep is probably the single most beneficial act we can take with regard to lifestyle to make sure we were prepared for the onslaught of a virus. And you want to get at least seven hours a night. And I know that's hard for some folks, but this is a good time to focus on it. Uh, I also think it's important to start eating as clean as you can. In particular, produce is especially valuable because it contains lots of antioxidants and vitamins that are generally beneficial for the body's immune system and allows us to fight back when necessary. And let me throw out some ideas on supplements. And although these are weakly beneficial, there have been enough studies done on them that I feel comfortable recommending it to my family, so I'll recommend it to you as well. Uh, vitamin D is probably the best prophylactic vitamin you can take. You go out and get some sunlight if you want, but in many parts of the country, it's still a little chilly, so taking some vitamin D3 orally, 1,200 international units is probably a reasonable dose. Makes sense. If you do feel like you're coming down with an illness uh, that might be the coronavirus, like you've got a fever and fatigue, uh, maybe a, a hacking cough that's dry, then I'd encourage you to take some vitamin C, a little bit morning, a little bit in the afternoon, because it washes out of your body pretty quickly. But zinc is also beneficial in a higher dose, but that's why you don't want to take it all the time but especially in that case might be useful. And then there are a couple ideas like beta-glucan, which comes from mushrooms and even elderberry that have been used in some studies, again, demonstrating a shortening of the course of illness. None of these are gonna make or break uh, your response, but it might be beneficial to have a little extra nudge in the right direction. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.